Nighty Watch on AIT, a program specially designed to bring you up to speed on all you need to know about this coronavirus and, of course, the COVID-19 disease caused by the virus. Hajia Amina Mina is Group Chief Operating Officer, MRS Holdings Limited. Uh, she's also the first vice chairman of the uh, Depot and Petroleum Products Marketers Association of Nigeria on the Oil and Gas uh, COVID-19 Committee. Uh, Vice President Miss, Midstream and Downstream Women in Energy Network. Haja, good to see you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Ma, for joining us. Now, let's look at the impact of the COVID-19 on the oil and gas sector, particularly the downstream sector where you are a major player. What really is happening there since this COVID-19 started? Um, well, I think um, as, a as a general overview, the oil industry as a whole has taken a huge hit. We've seen prices of crude oil drop to as low as $12 per metric ton, um, per barrel, sorry. And we know the impact of that in Nigeria, considering the fact that the major revenue generation for this country is oil. We know how that has impacted the economy as a whole. Now, specifically for the downstream, which is the area where I play, we've seen drop in revenue. We've seen probably loss in profits. A lot of companies are going to declare losses for the first quarter because there was a huge drop in demand. And I mean, it's definitely something that we're all just trying to recover from. We've also seen the impact on the people, the people who work for us. As you know, the oil industry is considered essential services, even in the midst of COVID. So we've had to think outside the box. We've had to go out of our way to ensure that our people, who are our greatest assets, are safe, they're well, they're able to get to their workplace and get back to their families healthy. We've had to make hygiene the watchword for everyone in the industry to ensure that we do not spread or contract the virus as it is. But the biggest impact, I think, is the economic impact that we would be seeing, not just now, but probably for some time to come. Hmm. Let, let's talk about the economic impact. That's what we are not seeing now. But probably, like, like you said, which will be seen in the days and weeks and months to come. The question is, are we prepared for, for that? What, what is the level of that economic impact right now? We know government, on his, government for instance, has already declared about 65% uh, revenue loss this year, mainly because our major projection, our major revenue earner is oil. And of course, like you said, it's, it's been taking a plunge since uh, the beginning of the year. So government on its own alone has lost almost 65% of its revenue projection. What about individual business people like you? What is, the le 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 is there a way to measure what the losses are at the moment? Um, I would say straight off the top of my head, everybody has had to go back and cut their budgets by in the minimum 40%. All the projections that were made, we've practically lost the first half of the year. So if you have projections to say that you're going to do X volume in the year, six months out of that one year, you've barely done any business. So your projections would have to be cut in half. So while government may be projecting a shortfall of 65%, individually, we will be projecting a shortfall of no less than 50%. 50%. 50% projection in losses. And we are talking of businessmen that have had to take bank loans. Some of you actually, before COVID-19, some of you may probably have taken loans for the purposes of expanding your investment and all of that. These are huge risks. Well, I think every business comes with its risk, you know, and sadly, the oil industry is one that's got very high risk. Um, we've had a lot of issues, particularly in our sector, where we've had people take loans from banks generally to do businesses. Unfortunately, things went belly up and they ended up in Amcon. 
um, particularly for depot owners. There are lots of depots today that are with Amcon, not because those depot owners were not able to um, fulfill their obligations, so to say, but because the business environment changed. Today, as you know, NNPC is the sole importer of petroleum products into this country. The reason being that much as there's the talk of deregulation, we're unable to access foreign exchange to import products today. So you have a situation where people have made the investments, they have built depots, but they're simply unable to use their depots to full capacity or to, in some cases, even 50% capacity. So, I mean, it, understandably, that means that those people will not be able to meet their financial obligations to the banks. It means that their business plans have gone out of the window and automatically they will default on those loans. Uh, uh, Hajia, this, this uh, idea of NNPC being the sole importer of products now, it, it, it evolved. It wasn't as if it was a deliberate government policy. It evolved because people like you uh, didn't have access or the access to foreign exchange was becoming uh, shrunk. And so people like you didn't have access. That's what happened, isn't it? If, that, if, if it is a deliberate well, government policy, is it the right policy? Well, to be fair, I don't think that it is a deliberate government policy. And like you said, we found ourselves in this position because it evolved over time. At some point, the private sector were importing 60, 70% of the products into this country. Now, sadly, even for those of us in the industry, we went through a phase where there was a lot of fraud in the industry. We're all aware of the subsidy scam that took place in this country. We had briefcase companies that overnight were oil traders. Everybody will tell you today, I'm an oil trader. And I ask people, what do you mean by you're an oil trader? You know, but for people, it was just a quick way to make money. And that, of course, affected the industry because before long, you had a situation where we suffered a huge credibility issue. Every Nigerian said thinking, oh, oil marketers are fraudulent people, which was definitely not the case because those of us who have been in the industry and will remain in the industry for the long term have always made our integrity our watchword. Now, with that situation where government ended up paying so much money in subsidies that could not be substantiated, we got to a point where government decided to scale back on subsidies, and we found ourselves in an era where NNPC were now the only people importing and claiming the under-recovery. So if I import at the time, and I knew that I was not going to get paid back the difference, be it on the recovery, be it subsidy, whatever you choose to call it. At the end of the day, it's the same thing, right? I would be importing at a loss. So we gradually got out of importing and allowed NMPC to be the only people who could do the importation. Now, is that a government policy? I don't think so. I think it's just a situation where the market dictated what happened at the time. But Coming back to where we are today, we've heard the GMB of NNPC, we've heard the Minister of State of Petroleum all say that the market has been deregulated. Um, and for us, what we're waiting to see is in this deregulation, we would like to see a level playing field, a transparent process where people who are serious, people who have made the needed investments, are able to access the foreign exchange which is needed to import products into the country. What I say to people all the time is you have to remember we are Nigerians, first and foremost. We took a risk, a business risk, and people would say, oh, it's risk and rewards. But we could have done other businesses, but we chose to be in this business to give back to our society. Um, we know the amount of people that we employ in the industry. So it's an industry that has to survive. If you look at the amount of people that work directly or indirectly, take depots, for example, the number of employees we have. Take the retail stations, the number of employees we have. Tanker drivers exist because we function. You know, so it's an industry that has to survive. It's an industry where government must make a deliberate um, policy to provide what is required in terms of regulation, 
in terms of the foreign exchange accessibility, in terms of just an enabling environment to encourage people to invest and keep the sector up and going. Hmm. I, I, I'm beginning to get it now. So it's like what we have now is a situation whereby you have a government player in the name of the NPC, and then you have private players like, like your humble self. Government with all the might and uh, backing is probably backing the NPC. Uh, can we call that deregulation really? Because you mentioned the issue of under recovery. If the NPC is in a position to make to make monies in the name of under recovery. And it, get, it, it, it takes this under recovery up front from government. That's like, that's like giving a, a government institution all the advantages and access, whereas individual players don't enjoy the same privileges from government. Because for me, under recovery is nothing short of a subsidy. So I wouldn't say that government is giving an NPC the backing and not giving private sector. You have to understand that um, government has a social responsibility, first of all, right? And that responsibility is one where they must ensure supply of petroleum products for all the reasons that we know, for security, for people to be able to move goods and services around. Um, so it's something that government must step in and do. Mm. Now, government is not private sector, right? There are things that government must do because they must take that, whether it's a loss or a profit, it is a social responsibility that government must take on. Whereas as private sector people, we're not in the business of charity. Mm -hmm. Like you mentioned, a lot of members, a lot of our members and colleagues are with Amcon. We have banks chasing us. So it's just a matter of, how you are able to account for these things, whereas government has a pocket that we don't have. So there are things that we simply cannot do. Mm. Okay. Well, uh, let, let me get the relationship that exists between uh, private depot owners like you, like you and the NLPC. The NLPC is the only organ, the only agency that can import. What then do you do? They import and they give to you to, for storage and distribution. Um, no, so the way it works today, NNPC does all of the importation. And those mm -hmm. of us who have depots will go to NNPC and buy the products from them in bulk mm -hmm. um, to our depots. And then from our depots, we sell on to other marketers and we also take some to our retail stations. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it's now a supplier-buyer relationship with NNPC. But I think it's important also to make clear that the NNPC has said severally that this is not a position that they want to be in. The GMD at every opportunity has made it clear that this is not the job of NNPC and they would rather the marketers are able to come back into this business. Mm. Because when you have marketers actually doing this business, as you know, with everything that has to do with private sector and, and public sector, there would be a lot of um, savings, a lot of efficiency. Uh, consumers would have the right to choose. There will be a lot of options. Mm. You know, NNPC is not doing this because they want to. And for us, what we're saying today is we're willing to work with government. We're willing to work with anybody to have a very transparent way of ensuring that the funds are made available. Mm. You know, the central bank we hope, would create a platform where there's liquidity for marketers to import. But let us, if we have to publish it to say, this is what I imported, this is how much I got from the central bank, this is the rate, but there has to be a way by which marketers are allowed to come back into the importation. Otherwise, the sector will die. Mm. Yeah, be because uh, invariably the NPC has become both a regulator and a player in the market, and it's, uh, it's, it's a compromising position, really. But uh, let's talk about the relationship between you and the banks. Is there a way government can make deliberate intervention, for instance? I know uh, I have a lot of friends in that sector, uh, in your sector. I mean, it's unfortunate that you talk about companies like Capital Oil and Gas being 
bankrupt, not because that company is not functioning well, but because of uh, 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 inability to manage the relationship between banks. And then Amcon comes in, is not doing the right thing. Uh, Amcon just simply takes over and closes those companies I mean, and, and all of that. Is there a way government can evolve deliberate policies? Or what are the deliberate things that you want government to do as interventions in the relationship between you and the banks, the relationship between you and Amcon, such that you are able to keep your businesses afloat? Well, to start with, yes, I think that there are lots of things that government can do. We have seen um, the impact of government policies in this COVID-19. We've seen all kinds of stimulus plans. We've seen the central bank come up to talk about um, some kind of plans, interventions, palliatives for the pharmaceutical industry and other industries. We expect government, or what we would hope for, is that government would call us, have a roundtable, sit with marketers, find out what the issues are, and genuine issues. I'm not talking about people who borrowed money from banks and used it for lifestyle or something else. But on a case-by-case -case basis, government should be able to look at it and say, okay, you took a loan to build a tank farm. Did you use that money to build the tank farm? Yes. You've used the money to build the tank farm. What happened to the business? What were the things that affected the business? Bear in mind that a lot of the people that ended up with Amcon um, didn't get there because they wanted to. They didn't get there because they took loans from banks and decided to just squander the money. As we everywhere else in the world, what happens in situations like this is you would sit down and look at the industry and say, what happened? And government will step in and give some kind of palliative to say, okay, let us help nurture these businesses back to a position where they function. We will monitor them. We will give them the much needed funds, but we will monitor the use of those funds. We will monitor, we will monitor the governance structure in those companies. In some instances, maybe even appoint independent directors just to check and ensure that, you know, the loans or the palliatives that have been put in place are not abused. So we want a situation where government steps in and basically rescues the industry. With the financial sector, I can understand if a bank gives you a loan, it's shareholders' money. Mm. At the end of the day, they expect you to give back that money. I don't think that the, um, the financial sector in Nigeria has evolved to the point where a bank can come in and say, okay, well, yeah, this was your business plan, but something went wrong, let's look at it. Banks are more, um, oh, banks, Amcon, are more into recovery, mm. more into recovery, not business reorganization, you know, and it's just the way it is. So it's something that government and the central bank will need to step in. Mm. I mean, like I said, we're talking about stimulus package for other industries. And I ask people, I say, the oil industry is probably one of the most essential industries. If we don't sell fuel through our stations, we can't move goods and services. Today, even with COVID-19, ambulances, hospitals, all run on fuel. If we don't work, nothing happens. So there's a very, it's a very critical role that we play. Mm. And once that is recognized, then I think that we'll be able to find a solution together with government, with financial institutions, to say, how do we bail out this industry? Mm. Thank you so much, uh, Adja. We'll definitely come back to this issue. It's a very, very topical issue uh, any day. We'll come back to it some other time, and we hope to be able to have you that time. But for now, thank you so much for your time this morning, Adja. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Hadja Amina Mina is a Group Chief Operating Officer, MRS Holdings Limited. She's also the first Vice Chairman, uh, Depot and Petroleum Products Marketers Association of Nigeria, uh, Vice President, Midstream and Downstream Women in Energy Network. Thank, thank you so much again, Hadja. Right. That's COVID-19 watch this morning. We had hoped that by now, 
the ongoing probe into the activities of the NDDC uh, and the House of Representatives will be ready. I will be taking you there, but they are not ready yet. But it's an event we are keeping our eyes on. Uh, Nancy Naj is not here, but we'll get something from her archives to bounce back while we wait for that uh, live proceedings uh, at the National Assembly where the NDDC is under investigation. Do enjoy it. My name is Ben Garlima. See you around.